In this session, you will learn more about the concept of regions and where Microsoft hosts Azure. You will also learn about virtual machines. And in Microsoft Azure, there are all kinds of virtual machines, different series like A, B, D, N, and others. What are they each used for, and why would I, as an MSP, choose to use one versus the other? We'll also dive deeper into the concept of B-series virtual machines, otherwise known as burstable virtual machines. Understanding compute and virtual machines are two more core elements needed to build a strong cloud practice in Microsoft Azure. We'll take you through examples of each using the Microsoft Azure portal and Nerdio for Azure, and by the end of this session, you will feel even more prepared to begin spinning up your first customer in Microsoft Azure. So the first fundamental uh, resource in Azure, and resources are you know, sort of the objects that uh, run up the meter and are you know, used in Azure. Some, some of them are, are paid, some of them are free, uh, and they all have sort of various uh, licensing and billing models. So we'll talk about compute and compute is just a fancy way of saying virtual machines. So when you look at Azure and you go into the virtual machines tab right here, what you can see is a list of virtual machines running in a particular environment. And you can see at the top, you can filter uh, this environment. You can filter it also by location. So there is, there is a term called region, which is the same as a location. And a region um, is a physical collection of data centers that are, uh, you know, geographically close to each other. They're well interconnected, meaning they have fast network connectivity in between them. And when you deploy a resource, uh, you select what region or location that resource gets deployed into. And different regions have different capabilities. So again, think of a region as just a collection of data centers. You don't really know which data center specifically something is going to go into, uh, but it will go into one of the data centers. Okay, so different regions have different capabilities. There is um, a few useful sites. So you can see Azure products by region. Let's search for that. There is a page that Microsoft puts together products by region, which has, um, you know, it used to be a table, but it's gotten to be so big that it's now a search box. So for example, if you want to search for a GPU, you want to know in what, um, in what location do you have GPUs available? So you can see here, there are regions listed across the top. Um, there's a little scroll bar in the bottom and you can find what type of a VM you want. So for instance, again, we, we're going to get into this, but the NV series, which uses the NVIDIA grid uh, GPU cards is available in US, uh, East US, East US 2, North Central, South Central, West US, etc. but not available, for example, in West, in West Central, in Canada, Canada Central, etc. Okay, so when you deploy any resource, so let's go ahead and add a virtual machine. And we're not gonna actually create one, but I'll show you what the selections are. So the first thing you do is you select what subscription it goes into, right? Because we already logged in into a tenant, so we have to select the subscription. Then we select our resource group. Okay, and then one other selection down here is the region, and again, you can see the list of everything that's here. Microsoft has, I think, about 52 regions or so. Um, my subscription doesn't have access to some of them. For example, the government regions require a special type of a subscription, so we don't have access to that. Um, but that is the concept of regions. Then the next thing to keep in mind regarding uh, VMs is that unlike in a private cloud environment where we can sort of flexibly decide what type of resource is assigned to what type of VM. So we can decide how many CPU cores, how many uh, gigs of RAM, how much storage, et cetera. In Azure, these things are packaged in very specific, uh, what's called you know, instances. When we talk about an instance of a VM that is a particular VM size. Okay, so let's let's look that up. So if we search for Azure 
virtual machine pricing. They have a pretty handy page that looks like this. And on this page, you will see that they, they've tried to group them a little bit, but uh, I'll go through, you know, so they tried to group them by, you know, either all general purpose, compute optimized, memory optimized, storage optimized, GPU, et cetera. So a few things to point out. So you can see, for instance, this is the V series VM. So every instance name or instance type will start with the letter B. B stands for burstable in this, in this particular case. It's a special type of instance. So I'm gonna skip it for now because there's a lot more to say about it. And let's jump down to the D series. The D series is generally the most popular standard type of general compute, general purpose instance. Um, this number indicates what version of the CPU. So there used to be you know, version one when it first came out, then version two, now version three. And you'll notice for each of the different versions, there is a different CPU chipset that gets utilized. And you know, the later the version, the pricing is different and the functionality is different, but they they usually have backwards compatibility. So you'll see V3 is listed at the top, but there's also V2 that's still available that you'll notice will have a different uh, processor architecture. Okay, so how, how does this work? So if you look at uh, the D instance, it has a number that follows the letter and the number in the case of V3, they made it really convenient that this second number happens to indicate how many virtual CPUs are going to be uh, inside of that VM. And then relative to that CPU, there's going to be a certain amount of memory. And what you'll notice is you can go in, uh, you basically can double. So as you go from one instance to the next one, you're doubling the amount of CPU and the ratio between RAM and CPU stays constant. So, you know, in this case, the ratio is one to four. So for every one core, you get four gigs of RAM. So when you have 16 cores, you would expect 64 gigs of RAM. Okay, so for every instance, uh, for every family, there is a certain CPU to RAM ratio. So for instance, if we look at the V2 series, V2 of, of D series, you'll see that the ratio is one to three and a half. So, you know, for four, we get 14 because it's three and a half. If you look at, you know, something called compute optimized, uh, then you have a ratio of one to two, right? Because you're getting more compute for a, the same amount of RAM. So whereas in the D series version three, you would get one CPU for four gigs of RAM. Here you're, you're getting two CPUs. And then the converse is true when you're looking at memory optimized, here the ratio is one to eight, okay? So it's really important to, to understand that you don't have a sort of infinite flexibility into how you configure these VMs. You cannot have one with six cores, for example, right? Nothing on this list has six cores, whereas in the case of uh, vSphere and NPC, we certainly could, uh, could have six cores available on the VM. What the instance family and size determines is primarily the amount of CPU and RAM and the amount of temporary storage. What do I mean by temporary storage? So in Azure, there is always a D drive that's deployed for a Windows VM usually, uh, and that is labeled as temporary storage. It's most of the time it's an SSD drive for, for most of the instances. Some families have it be non-SSD, but we'll talk about the distinction in later sessions. So there's always a temporary disk which gets lost every time you deprovision and reprovision a VM. So if you were to shut one down, like stop it at the Azure level and then start it back up, it would likely start on another host inside of the Azure cloud and any storage or anything stored in this temporary disk would actually get lost. So it's important to keep in mind this is good for sort of scratch space and, and you know, page file and things that could go away at the reboot time, but there's no real data that could be stored here. If you actually click on one of these disks, you'll see it will say, you know, data loss warning, there will be a text file there warning you not to store anything. The other thing you'll notice is I'm gonna switch this pricing from hour to month, just to make the point. So here's what you'll notice. You'll notice that the cost is roughly proportional 
to the number of CPUs. Okay, so for instance, as we go from D2 to a D4, we're doubling the number of CPUs and we are roughly doubling, or in this case, exactly doubling the cost. And as we go from a four to eight, we're also again, doubling the cost. So this is true for most series and most VMs in Azure. The cost is proportional to CPU. The RAM is proportional to CPU. So it's a nice sort of um, unit to keep in mind that uh, kind of unifies everything. Okay. Uh, let's look at a few different instance types. So we have the D series that we talked about is, is kind of general purpose. Uh, the oldest and sort of most basic series is called the A series. Uh, I think that was the first one that came out. It's, it's uh, a one to two CPU to RAM ratio. Uh, they do not support solid state. So they do not support SSD temporary storage. Uh, it's, it's regular, you know, spinning media. And it, it, they're fairly inexpensive if you're doing them as, as a pay-as-you-go versus doing a reserved instance, which again, we'll talk about later. You can see whenever there is a letter M added to the instance name, that means it's a memory optimized instance. So in this case, you know, if an A2 is a one to two ratio, here it's an A2M, their ratio is one to eight in terms of CPU to RAM. The other common instance types are burstable instances. They're somewhat complicated to understand, but the concept here is if you log into this VM, you will see that it will have you know, either one CPU, one gig of RAM, or eight CPUs, 32 gigs of RAM, but there is a certain amount of quota that is imposed on the performance of this VM. So think of this in the, in the world of VMware as a limit, on the CPU consumption that you place on the VM object. So inside of the OS, you're seeing all eight cores, but you cannot always use all eight cores. What does that mean? It means that you get a certain amount, certain fraction of the eight cores you can use on an ongoing basis. Let's say you get you know, 25%, which means you get a fourth or two CPUs worth of capacity that you can use on an ongoing basis. And then at any time you use less than your quota, you're building up what's called credit. It's called banking credits. And anytime you use anything above your quota, you are consuming credits, assuming that you've built some credits or you banked some credits in the past. So what does this specifically mean? Let's take a look at um, an example. So the calculation is very complicated, uh, fairly complicated, I should say but we've implemented it in the NAP to really simplify things. So let me give you an example. So here is a uh, B2S, which is two core, four gigs of RAM. There is a certain amount of quota. And what this tells me, basically NAP pulled in the information and said over the last 24 hours, we've banked 576 credits. What that means, who knows? We'll explain that in a second. And we've consumed 82 credits. So what this is telling me is that on average, over the last 24 hours, I've consumed less CPU than the quota that's given to this VM, which means it's a good use case for a B instance. What you don't wanna see is you don't wanna see having zero banked credits and all of them being consumed in the last 24 hours because that's indicating that you are being CPU constrained and you are demanding to use more CPU or your VM is demanding more CPU than is available to it. If you mouse over this little I, it's going to actually take these number of credits, figure out based on the instance size and the quota on this instance, how many hours of running this instance at 100% capacity or 100% CPU capacity you have. So six hours is typically the maximum. You can only bank six hours worth of credits over a 24 hour period. And if you don't use them, they kind of, it's, it's a rolling, it's a rolling you know, set of credits that you can, you can bank. So what does this mean? I have this instance, it's two cores. I'm using less CPU than is available to me with my quota, which means I'm banking credits. And if I were to just launch something on this VM that would use both CPUs at 100%, it could do that for six hours straight 
And after that point, it would get constrained by the underlying hypervisor down to whatever the quota happens to be. And that's something that you can just Google quickly, you know, Azure burstable instance quota. And there's a little table that shows you what that is. The other instances I want to mention are um, D. So, so I mentioned the D instances version three versus version two. What you'll notice is version three has a couple of um, um, uh, things. There's not a single core instance size. It starts at two cores. There also is a one to four ratio between CPU and RAM versus one to three and a half. But the most significant difference is that when you are looking at vCPU on the v3 of the D family instances, you're talking about hyper-threaded CPUs. What does that mean? So if you have a single physical core with a processor that supports hyper-threading and a hypervisor that supports hyper-threading, then that core can be presented as two CPUs to the VM. And that's what the version three of the D instance is all about. It's hyper-threaded cores. And as a result, you'll notice that it's cheaper than the version two, even though it has more RAM. So let's make a note. So D2 SV3, which is two, two, two by eight, is $137. And if you look at D1, I'm sorry, D2 V2, which is a two by seven, is 170, right? So you have a little bit of a premium that you're paying for, even though you're getting less RAM with it. Why is that? The reason is that in the version two of the D series, the cores are not hyper-threaded, which means these two are actual physical cores on the VM. Whereas in a, in a V3, this would actually be four cores if they were hyper-threaded. So that's a significant differentiator between V2 and V3. Uh, the other popular ones, you know, we rarely see F, we rarely see E, um, although what's nice about E is they have a very high CPU to RAM ratio. It's one to eight instead of one to four. So if somebody has a very RAM hungry workload, let's say like a, a terminal server that is not CPU bound, but is RAM bound, which is generally not the case. Usually CPU is what, what the constraint is on the terminal, not RDS session host. Then in this case, you can see an E2 V3 has two CPUs and 16 gigs of RAM, and it's not much more than a D2 V3, which has the same two CPUs and eight gigs of RAM. You see that? And it's even less than a D2 V2, which is two CPUs and seven gigs of RAM. But those CPUs are different because they're, they're actual physical cores rather than hyper-threaded cores. Okay, then we've got, um, again, this is just different memory ratios. So here you'll notice this is one to seven instead of one to three and a half, uh, et cetera. Uh, the G series, again, we rarely see. The M series are monstrous. So M series, there is this one, <laughs> you'll see the price of so this is 128 cores and four terabytes of ram at twenty six thousand dollars a month okay haven't seen anyone use that one yet but there's some you know use cases for it um okay let's keep going because the one i really want to show you is the n series so anything that starts with an n stands for nvidia and you know nc we don't use ncv2 we don't use and CV3 we don't use, NV we do. And NV are the only ones that can be used to deliver GPU using this grid 2.0 technology, which allows uh, the graphical uh, you know, component to be offloaded to the physical GPU inside of the VM. You can see it starts at an NV6. It has six cores at a minimum and maxes out to NV24, which is four cores. You can see the ratio here is kind of this weird you know, whatever that is, it's, you know, roughly, uh, you know, like a one to 10 ish, a little bit less of CPU to RAM. Uh, they are quite pricey, but what we're really excited about is that uh, these guys are coming out and this is going to be NV version two. You can see here the, the RAM was doubled and the price actually went down. It's probably half or less than that. So, you know, you're getting more RAM 
for the same amount of the CPU, a faster CPU and a faster GPU, and you're paying, you're going to be paying significantly less. NC series and ND series are, are GPU backed VMs, but they're used mostly for like scientific research and machine learning and, uh, you know, the CUDA framework. They're not really used in a virtual desktop context as much, and they can't really be used in the virtual desktop context because the Windows Server 2016 RDS doesn't support them uh, for GPU offload. Okay, the next thing I want to show you is um, explain. Let's see, let's open up. Let's open up this guy. So when you look at the VM, uh, in Azure, you know, there's all kinds of configuration. We'll go through it at some point, but for now, what you can see is there is a status and the status right now is stopped in parentheses deallocated. And there are a few terms that, that are kind of used interchangeably that that's a bit confusing. In Azure, a VM could be in one of three states. It could be started, right? So if I click the start button, it would actually start this VM. When the VM is started, it's running the meter, meaning Azure is billing me for the compute that that VM is consuming. If I stop that VM from the Azure portal, it's actually gonna put it into a stopped deallocated state. So again, you can stop a VM and it be in a deallocated state. When the VM is deallocated, I'm not being billed for the compute component of this VM. I'm still being built for its storage, so we'll talk about that separately, but I'm not being built for the compute. And there is a in-between state called stopped but provisioned. Okay, stopped by provisioned can happen when you shut the OS down from within the operating system without stopping the VM from the Azure hypervisor or the Azure control plane right here. So in that sense, the VM is down, meaning it's not accessible because the OS is, is not running, but you're still running up the bill. So in the NAP, if, if a situation like that ever occurs, what you'll notice is this will be like a red triangle that's going to indicate to you if you mouse over that it's stopped but provisioned, which means that that VM was shut down from the OS and it's either need to be started, so it's, it's useful, or it needs to be stopped so it gets deallocated. So core quotas is a protection that Microsoft has, has put into the, uh, into the environment so that when you spin up a, 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 when you spin up a subscription, you are limited as far as how much, um, how much CPU you can consume from Azure. And, and the reason for that is kind of obvious, but you know, they providing this to you on credit and then you pay for it on consumption. So imagine some, you know, some uh, hacker, you know, steals a credit card, signs up for an Azure subscription, goes in, spins up, you know, an M128S, which is $26,000 a month, runs it for two weeks, and then the credit card gets canceled and then Microsoft can't collect. Uh, on that amount. So to protect themselves from that, they even post something called core quotas. Core quotas is a property of a subscription. So if we go back into our subscriptions here and we go under usage and quotas, what this will tell you is what my quotas are specifically for compute. And there's other things that, are, that have quotas associated with them, but let's just select compute in this case because that's the easiest one to understand. So I have a NV family quota of 24 cores, and I'm currently using 18 of them. I have a region quota, meaning in one single region, I cannot use more than 350, and I'm currently using 44. And then you can see the same thing on a per family basis. So for instance, I have a limit on the number of DS family CPUs of 350 and I'm currently using two. So the reason these quotas are so high is because I am using an MPN, a Microsoft Partner Network subscription. Those natively come with very high quotas. If you sign up for a free subscription, you have a quota of four CPUs, which is insufficient to deploy even the most basic uh, NFA environment, which is why when somebody goes in to provision a free subscription in NFA, 
the, it validates how many cores are available and it will not allow them to proceed because there isn't sufficient amount of quota. But you can imagine that whatever that, that limit is, it's four for free subscription, it's 10 for a typical pay-as-you-go subscription, it's 20 for a CSP subscription. Many times that needs to be increased. And the way that's increased is through this re increase request 